Hello, my name is Andrew Beer. I'm a research physical scientist for the USDA in Kimberly, Idaho. This talk is centered around soil organic carbon dynamics in three of our research locations. First, I'll provide a little background on the three research locations. Then we will look at some of our observed data for soil organic carbon to answer some interesting questions about how management is affecting soil organic carbon levels. Don't be afraid, but we will also walk through some statistical analysis. One big part of what I've been working on recently is the use of a model to simulate each of our research locations. So we will have an introduction to models, discuss the model that I utilized, and talk about some of the problems I encountered while modeling our research locations. Finally, we will conclude by going over what the model projects will happen to soil organic carbon up until year 2050 in our three cropping systems. Our three research locations are affectionately referred to as the cover crop study, the grace nut study, and the long-term manure study. The cover crop study was initiated in fall of 2015 on a previously furrow irrigated field. It's a continuous corn cropping system where we're testing three factors, tillage, manure, or winter cover. Plots were arranged with or without manure application, with or without winter cover in the form of triticale, and with conventional tillage or no-till practices. Here, manure was applied on a dry weight basis at a rate of 30 tons per acre. The grace net study was initiated in fall of 2012 on a linear irrigated field. This is a typical dairy forage rotation of corn, barley, and alfalfa with treatments of fall or spring applied manure, fall applied compost, and spring applied urea or super urea, as well as a new treatment control. Here, manure was applied at a rate of 30 tons per acre and compost was applied at a rate of 15 tons per acre. The long-term manure study was initiated in fall of 2012 on a sprinkler irrigated field. It's a commercial cropping rotation of wheat, potato, barley, and sugar beet, and revolves around variable manure application rates and application frequencies. Annual or biennial manure application was paired with application rates of 8, 16, or 23 tons per acre, with the addition of a synthetic fertilizer treatment and a new treatment control. Okay, the first thing we will look at is the long-term manure study. We will follow with the grace net study and then talk about the cover crop study. The first thing we are looking at are the raw values of soil organic carbon we obtained for each treatment in each year. Here, table cells that contain the same letter within each column are not significantly different from each other, but we will walk through the most important points. On the left, you will see treatment designations, A for annual application and B for biennial applications. I'll add red arrows at the bottom of the screen to indicate years that received manure from biennial treatments. One overall trend we saw was that after harvesting either potato or sugar beet, the mixing of the soil that occurred during harvest probably reduced soil organic carbon test values compared to the preceding year. This has nothing to do with treatments, but you should consider this if you are tracking your soil organic carbon in a rotation that includes either crop. You may consider comparing soil organic carbon at a standard point in time in the rotation, like in the fall after wheat in our example. By 2019, there was no significant difference between the synthetic fertilizer and the no treatment control. By 2019, in all cases, the annual applications resulted in numerically higher soil organic carbon levels than their biennial counterparts. Lastly, as one would expect, as the application rate increased, so did the average soil organic carbon content. So then, how much is soil organic carbon changing each year on average? To assess the average change in soil organic carbon per year, simple linear regression was used to plot soil organic carbon level as a function of year among the study treatments. The resulting slope estimates and confidence intervals provide some inference. The estimate is our best estimate of average annual change. The confidence interval states that we are 95% certain that the true slope is between this interval. This analysis indicates that applying at least 8 tons per acre annually or 23 tons per acre biennially will result in building soil organic carbon. The estimated slopes indicate that you will probably build soil organic carbon under lower application rates. However, as the confidence interval for these treatments included zero, we cannot be certain. Moving on, a couple other questions we wanted to answer are, is there a distinct difference between annual and biennial application? And can we predict soil organic carbon change based on application frequency and application rate? To test if there is a difference between annual and biennial manure applications, we used a linear mixed effects model and analysis of variance on a subset of data. Remember those statistics? Well, we're gonna walk through some. First, the model indicated is a significant effect of application frequency. However, it also indicated that the effect of frequency is dependent on both the rate of application and which year we look at. 
To clear things up, we performed an additional contrast test between two specific treatments we found interesting, 8 tons per acre annually and 16 tons per acre biennially, as theoretically they add the same amount of carbon to the soil. Here there was evidence that they had different effects on soil organic carbon level in only 2013 and were otherwise equal. So there was a difference in annual and biennial manure applications, but that difference is dependent on the application rate and year of measure. In other words, there is evidence that an annual application at rate 1x is not different than a biennial application at rate 2x. However, considering other combinations of rates and frequencies complicates the problem. Now let's finish discussion of the LT manure study with some simple predictive modeling. Here, the objective was to obtain a prediction equation for soil organic carbon levels or estimated change based on manure application rate, application frequency, and years in the system. This was achieved using multiple linear regression fitting rate, frequency, and years as continuous effects. Although the multiple linear regression method has flaws for this type of data, it allows us to make inferences on the average effect of treatments that we did not necessarily test. The example that is shown is the modeled effect on soil organic carbon levels after five years of manure application at a rate of five and 10 tons per acre applied annually, a frequency of one, biennially, a frequency of 0.5, and triennially, a frequency of 0.33. This is only a simple model based on our observed data, but if you'd like to know what it says about your system, feel free to email me. Now discussing the GraceNet study, here are the raw values of soil organic carbon for each treatment in each year. Cells containing the same letter within each column were not statistically different. I've also placed red areas beneath years where the manure was applied. At no point in time were soil organic carbon levels of either synthetic fertilizer treatment different from the control. By 2019, soil organic carbon under the fall manure application was numerically higher than the spring application, but this was not statistically significant. This particular analysis suggests that there isn't a difference between applying manure in the fall or spring when it comes to accumulating soil organic carbon. Similarly, by 2019, the average soil organic carbon under the fall compost application was numerically between the spring manure and control treatments but not significantly different from either. So it is inconclusive what effect fall compost application had on soil organic carbon accumulation. Let's move on and see how much soil organic carbon is changing per year on average in this dairy forage rotation. Here, we are looking at simple linear regression analysis again. The confidence interval for the slope of both synthetic fertilizer treatments and the control included zero. Therefore, we cannot be certain that soil organic carbon changed at all in these treatments. The remaining year treatments accumulated soil carbon with estimates in the descending order fall manure, spring manure, and fall compost. This analysis suggests a slight benefit to applying manure in the fall versus in the spring when considering soil organic carbon accumulation. Moving on, two questions we wanted to answer were, is there really a difference between fall and spring applied manure? And how did the three years of alfalfa affect soil organic carbon levels? To answer whether there really is a difference between fall and spring manure application, a linear mixed effects model was used in conjunction with analysis of variance on a subset of data. Here, fall or spring manure application was considered a timing effect. The results indicate a significant main effect of year, but no significant main effect of timing. The timing by year interaction could be considered marginally significant, meaning we can conduct further contrast testing to assess the effect of timing in various years. Here, there was strong evidence that there was no difference between the effects of timing on soil organic carbon levels from 2012 to 2018. In 2019, a significant difference was indicated. Upon further inspection, these results can be explained by the suspiciously large difference between fall and spring manure application in 2019. Practically, I find that significant evidence is lacking to conclusively state that fall manure application results in greater soil organic carbon accumulation. Now, how did the alfalfa affect soil organic carbon levels? To assess if alfalfa had an effect on soil organic carbon levels, data was subset for the first and last year alfalfa was grown, and a paired Welch's t-test conducted that assesses if the difference in means, in our case soil organic carbon levels before alfalfa and soil organic carbon levels after alfalfa, is different from zero. There was no evidence that the difference in means was different from zero. In other words, soil organic carbon did not change during the three years of alfalfa. That being said, let's move on to the cover crop study. Here are the raw values of soil organic carbon for each treatment in each year of the cover crop study. Cells containing the same letter within each column were not statistically different. 
First, the initial values of soil organic carbon were approximately 30% lower than at either the GraceNet or long-term manure studies. This is likely because the site is located at the head of a historically furrow irrigated field and slowly had soil carbon erode over time. From 2017 to 2019, the only obvious differences in soil organic carbon were between treatments with manure application and those without. Let's see how much soil organic carbon is changing per year on average. This is another simple linear regression analysis. This time, the confidence interval for the slope of all treatments was above zero, indicating that all treatments observed soil organic carbon accumulations during the period of study. Treatments where manure was applied had considerably higher soil organic carbon slope estimates, while there was no obvious impact of winter cover or tillage practice. One thing I should note is that although soil organic carbon is seen here to accumulate quickly, these rates would not be expected to continue in perpetuity as soil organic carbon levels reach plateau levels based on soil properties, climate, and management. One bit of anecdotal evidence are the records of the Idaho Dairymen's Association, which has records from sites with a 20 to 30 year history of manure application, and most soil organic carbon levels are between 2 and 3 percent, with only a few over 4 percent. To see if the effects of tillage practice or triticale cover could be separated from the large effect of manure, a linear mixed effects model was used fitting the factors of manure, cover, tillage, and year. The analysis indicated significant main effects of manure and year, however there was also significant interactions effects suggesting that the effect of manure varied by year, the effect of tillage varied by year, and the interaction of manure and tillage varied by year, which was further explained using contrast testing. The interaction between manure and year could be explained as the first year soil organic carbon was measured, manure had not yet been applied. The interaction between tillage and year indicated there may be a marginal difference in how tillage practice affects soil organic carbon levels in 2019 only. The three-way interaction clearly indicates that tillage practice affected soil organic carbon levels only in 2019 and only where manure was applied. Practically, I believe this was due to the very high soil organic carbon levels obtained under the no-till, no-manure triticale treatment in 2019, and there is not significant evidence to suggest that tillage practice has actually affected soil organic carbon accumulation in the system. But keep in mind, these are small research plots and were only initiated in 2015. It will be interesting to see if different results are obtained after a few more years that the management practices are in place. Okay, now let's get into models. First and foremost, I don't consider myself a modeler, but now I can say I have some experience with models. Models are representations of our understanding of a system to help us better understand real world problems. In agricultural science, this could represent a myriad of different things from a whole farm, one barn in a farm, or a single field, depending on what system the model attempts to replicate. If a model accurately represents a system, inferences can be made under variations in management or for predicting the outcome of future scenarios. We know a model is accurate when it has been calibrated and validated for a scenario. Calibration is the process of adjusting model parameters to force model output to agree with real world data from the process of interest based on goodness of fit indicators. Validation is assessing the performance of the calibrated model on a new scenario using goodness of fit indicators. It's intended to verify that the model is performing as expected. Since models are typically calibrated and validated for a particular use case, they typically come to a local optimization of a particular response or set of responses. Global optimization is distinguished from local optimization by considering all responses. Calibrating models typically finds a local solution for a set of responses rather than the global solution for all model parameters. It has come to our attention that some of these models are sometimes being used in an off-the-shelf capacity without calibration to make inferences about the potential for carbon storage. To that end, the performance of models run in such a capacity is relatively unknown. As we have three diverse research sites with excellent soil carbon data, we decided to assess the performance of the commonly utilized denitrification decomposition model in a default condition and after an initial calibration. First, let's look at the DNDC model interface and how data was compared. This is the DNDC model interface. First, climate parameters and weather files are loaded into the model. Then users specify soil parameters like texture and initial soil organic carbon level. Users go on to create a management schedule consisting of crop parameters, planting and harvest dates, fertilizer and manure applications, irrigation schedules, and any grazing or crop cuttings for alfalfa, for example. And once the system is specified, you can run the scenario. The denitrification decomposition model provides some model output on crop performance. 
carbon, nitrogen, and water balances, as well as estimates of greenhouse gas emissions. However, to assess the performance of the model, we needed to extract the model output and compare it with field observations at the time they took place. For the calibration of the model, we chose to look at biomass carbon, or crop yield, so organic carbon content, nitrogen mineralization, soil moisture, and estimated crop evapotranspiration. Summary statistics of goodness of fit with field observations were produced. During calibration, model parameters were changed in an effort to optimize the goodness of fit. Although all fit statistics were produced for each treatment in each research site, we simply don't have time to go through them all. Therefore, we will discuss holistic model performance and any issues encountered during modeling. The goodness of fit statistics are shown on the right for overall model performance. The default model condition is shown on the left and the initial calibrated condition shown on the right. For crop biomass, the continuous corn cropping system of the cover crop site was simulated the best, although issues were encountered when trying to calibrate to triticale yield. At GraceNet, the red box in the default condition indicates where 2017 alfalfa growth failed under the default model condition. Initial calibration corrected this shortcoming. However, yield under the first year of alfalfa was overestimated due to problems with how perennial crops are simulated in the model. For all three sites, access to soil water had to be improved in order to accurately simulate crop yields. This involved reducing crop water demands and modifying soil field capacity and wilting point beyond their known values to allow more water into the system. This is potentially an indication that water is not simulated correctly by the denitrification decomposition model in our irrigated environment. Cover crop fit with soil organic carbon declined slightly from the default as a result of attempts to better simulate triticale yield. Grace net fit with soil organic carbon well in the default capacity. However, the calibration efforts improved all fit statistics modestly. The LT manure model in the default capacity underestimated soil organic carbon, probably as of the initial estimate of soil organic carbon was low. It was evident at all sites, but especially at the long-term manure site, that the de nitrification decomposition model underpredicts nitrogen mineralization where manure is applied at a low rate or where manure is not applied. Okay, that was a lot, so let's pick a few summary points. The soil water module in DNDC did not accurately depict soil water in R3 systems, posing a larger question to similar systems. If soil water is not simulated correctly, there are other effects on decomposition dynamics. Proceed carefully if you intend to use model output as, such as greenhouse gas values, as they are highly dependent on soil water content. Increasing the nitrogen mineralization by increasing decomposition rates results in decomposition of soil carbon and underprediction of soil carbon levels. Leaving the decomposition rates as default results in crop nitrogen stress, especially when manure is not applied, reducing the accuracy of predicted yields. So organic carbon content is hard to model. In a default capacity, the DNDC model's error was over four tons of carbon per acre. While calibration can improve the model fit, error was still on the scale of a few tons of carbon per acre. Take care with any absolute values you intend to use regarding soil organic carbon storage. Now, we will conclude the presentation by extending the calibrated models to 2050 and looking at the projected impacts on soil organic carbon. The high and low emission scenarios did not make a difference in the modeling of soil organic carbon levels in any site. At LT Manure, there is no projected difference between 8 tons per acre applied annually and 16 tons per acre applied biennially on a long-term basis, supporting our earlier analysis. However, there was no saturation point reached, even under the highest manure application rate. This is concerning for speculations made on potential carbon storage. So the synthetic fertilizer treatment is suggested to slowly mine soil organic carbon in the long term. At GraceNet, fall manure is projected to result in greater soil organic carbon levels after many years. This contrasts my personal opinion, but since the model is based on our observed data, it does make sense given our earlier analysis. Similar to the LT manure site, the synthetic fertilizer treatment appears to slowly mine soil organic carbon in the long term. At cover crop, when manure was applied, no-till did not appear to benefit soil organic carbon accumulation. Within each tillage practice, the treatments with triticale cover accumulated more soil organic carbon when manure was applied. Notably, it appears as though soil organic carbon is projected to decline under only synthetic fertilizer unless no-till is combined with cover crops, seen with a pink line here. No-till is not projected to result in soil organic carbon benefits when manure was not applied. However, keep in mind these are only models constructed with our study's data. Plenty of other research indicates that no-till and winter cover are favorable practices for building soil organic carbon, so don't count them out just yet. That concludes my discussion on soil organic carbon accumulation in our three cropping systems, and if there are any questions, I'd love to take them.